Just a couple of housekeeping things before I introduce our speaker. Um, one of them has kind of um, demonstrated uh, the need. Uh, could you make sure your phones can't possibly join in, please? Um, also, if you need the loo, you go through that iron gate there, turn left and there on the left. You will find that there are people with clearly marked Amnesty collection tins. If you want to um, give uh, to Amnesty, please give into those tins um, and that, uh, that will, it will ensure that it goes to the right place. This year, our um, lecture is uh, Professor Dame Sarah Thornton. We're very, very glad to see you this evening. Uh, and she's going to speak on modern slavery hidden in plain sight. The recent global slavery estimates suggested there are 50 million people across the world, either in forced labor or forced marriages. And the number is increasing despite a United Nations commitment to end slavery by this year. What lies behind the cruel exploitation of our fellow human beings and what can be done about it by governments, businesses, and individuals? And uh, Dame Sarah is very well placed to talk about this. She served a three-year term as the UK Independent Anti-Slavery Commissioner from 2019 to 2022 and is currently a consultant in modern slavery at CCLA Investment Management and a professor of practice in modern slavery policy at the Wrights Lab at the University of Nottingham, where she focuses on research in the area of prevention, business responses, supply chains, and the role of the financial sector in tackling modern slavery. For 33 years, she worked in policing, serving both as the Chief Constable of Thames Valley Police and the Chair of the National Police Chiefs Council. The lecture is being live streamed on the Cathedral's YouTube channel, and after the lecture, she's very kindly offered to um, spend some time in question and answer. As it's being live streamed, and as there are plenty of people in this transept, um, I will go round with a handheld. So if you put your hand up, I'll come round with the mic. Um, and then if you speak into the mic, everyone will be able to hear you not only here, but also on the channel. I think the only other um, practical thing that I need to say to you is that in the unlikely event of a fire or any other emergencies, please follow the directions of the stewards who you see in the, white, uh, in the red scapula um, just over there. Uh, Shirley, uh, could you wave so we can see you? Thank you. Uh, and so I now hand over to Dame Sarah with thanks. Thank you very much indeed, Jessica, and good evening, everybody. Um, thank you very much uh, to uh, the local Amnesty International for inviting me to give this uh, Benja uh, Amnesty Lecture today and just to have the opportunity to be in such a beautiful space. So thank you, thank you very much. And, and when I was doing a little bit of research about Ely Cathedral, uh, I thought, how fitting uh, that you've asked me to speak about modern slavery, because this is a cathedral which has used its space over the last few years to raise awareness. I see that you've held events here, very much focused on local issues around seasonal workers, but also um, you've had projects for, for school children. And I, I see that the wonderful Sarah Sharma exhibition, uh, which is, um, uh, she's an artist uh, who um, portrays um, slavery from the perspective of survivors. I, I see it came here and I saw it in London two or three years ago. So it's, it's great to be following in the footsteps of, of lots of really important work to raise awareness of what is in fact uh, hidden in plain sight. And I'm gonna start with a, a quotation from Barack Obama. It ought to concern every person because it is a debasement of our common humanity. It ought to concern every community because it tears at our social fabric. It ought to concern every business because it distorts markets. It ought to concern every nation because it endangers public health and fuels violence and organized crime. I'm talking about the injustice, the outrage of human trafficking, 
which must be called by its true name, modern slavery. That man had a very uh, wonderful ability to sum up the issues. Uh, and I'm going to talk about uh, modern slavery this evening. Um, as Jessica said, the recent global slavery estimates suggested that there were 50 million people across the globe who were either in forced labor or forced marriage. And while the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal, uh, 8.7, is to eradicate forced labor and end modern slavery by 2030, conflict, instability, and the pandemic have resulted in more people being exploited. And in fact, the figures that were published last year um, were, uh, showed a 10 million increase on the previous estimates. So it's an issue, I'm afraid, that's growing. But of those 50 million, nearly 28 million uh, are held in forced labor across the globe most of them in private businesses. People who've been tricked, coerced, or forced into exploitation and cannot escape. In 2023, 20, that means they're prevented from escaping either through psychological control, threats of violence, or simply the confiscation of their passports. Given the numbers, we must understand that modern slavery isn't an exceptional occurrence but it is entwined in modern life. We all buy products and services without realizing the human cost. In 2021, it was estimated that goods worth 26 billion pounds at risk uh, were imported into the UK that were at risk of modern slavery. 26 billion pounds worth of goods imported. Electronics, garments, palm oil, solar panel uh, come at some of the top uh, products. So what I'm going to do in this lecture is um, discuss that cruel exploitation of our fellow human beings, but also talk about what I think the responses should be from government, from business, and for all of us as, as individuals. And as you're sitting there, you might be thinking, well, surely not in Ely, in this beautiful city uh, in, in Cambridgeshire. Um, well, I used to live in Oxford, and I might have said, surely not in Oxford. In fact, I lived in North Oxford, which is the nicest bit of Oxford. And one might have said, surely, not in North Oxford, um, but it's hidden in plain sight. When I lived in North Oxford, a, a family from the Middle East rented a neighbor's house for summer. When they returned, when the family returned, they found a letter concealed behind a chest of drawers. And the letter was from a domestic servant addressed to her sister in the Philippines. She was pleading for help. Another neighbor said that she'd seen a woman hanging out washing in the back garden, but had never left the house with the rest of the family uh, during the stay. In lovely North Oxford, a young woman had been held in domestic servitude and none of us had known. This was five doors down from where I lived. She was hidden in plain sight. And then to Ely, as you all know, I'm sure that we're in the Fen region where 33% of England's vegetables are grown. And we know that many people come as seasonal workers to our farms and they can be vulnerable to exploitation. Every year, thousands of workers come from countries including Indonesia, Nepal, Ukraine to work in our country on six months seasonal agricultural visas. Historically, the vast majority of the UK's seasonal agricultural workers came from Europe. But after Brexit, the, a visa scheme was launched in 2019 to cover anticipated labor shortages. And this year, in 2023, 55,000 visas were available. Now, some do have a good experience, but have probably still incurred massive debt to get here. Others are subject to harsh, and I would argue, inhumane treatment, discrimination, wage theft, and abuse. Many live in terrible conditions, the cost of which is docked from their pay, cold, damp, crowded, and unhealthy. And what's so frustrating about it the farms, the labor providers, the supermarkets, and government, they're all aware that there are problems, but everybody seems unable to solve them. And frankly, everybody blames everybody else. A worker from Kazakhstan told researchers, even in our post-Soviet Union countries, no one runs a business like that by making people live in such terrible conditions. I think this is an issue for, for all of us. So what I'm gonna talk about um, in terms of the structure, I thought I'd talk a little bit about modern slavery in context. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, modern slavery in the context of slavery over, over the centuries. I'll then talk about slavery in the UK, 
and then, um, as I've promised, talk about the government response, the business response, and then all of us and our individual response. So, to start with modern slavery uh, in context, and I want to say a little bit about the term. When we use the term slavery, we often think of transatlantic slavery. But of course, slavery has existed for at least 4,000 years as a common practice across many societies and many systems of government. But I think in particular, the transatlantic slavery captures our concern because that middle passage was very different. It's estimated that 12 to 15 million people were transported across the Atlantic. And I think what a lot of experts would say, it's pretty unique in the way it completely obliterated family ties. And people could not return to their roots. Children were treated as property and could be split up and sold. Um, people were regarded as chattel property. It was chattel slavery. Um, and I think that happened much more in the Atlantic system uh, than any other system of slavery. But I think it's important to think about slavery existing for thousands of years in different forms. And what I think is interesting, while I'm on the subject, you know, in our history lessons, I think most often, certainly in my day, the focus was on the abolition rather than the evil of slavery. Uh, we've all heard of William Wilberforce, and if we're in the, this part of the world, we've probably heard of Thomas Clarkson as well. Uh, but we've not heard so much about the exploitation of others and the wealth that was created. We like to kind of uh, cast ourselves as the heroes rather than the villains uh, of the piece. But having mentioned the context, I really do want to talk about modern slavery today, where the focus isn't so much on strict ownership, but about the denial of agency through force or threat or coercion. And before I go into detail about that, I think it's just worth mentioning the intersection, the overlap uh, with climate issues. Because I would argue that when we talk about a climate crisis, we could also be talking about a human rights crisis. Uh, and what do I mean by that? As we damage the environment, we're also damaging communities. We deprive communities of their livelihood. We deprive them of access to water. They end up in extremely precarious work. Ancient land, land rights are completely ignored. And of course, all these things make it so much more likely that people uh, are on the move. And in turn, displaced people are exposed to much higher risks of modern slavery. Um, I think the data suggests that if your uh, migrant populations are three times uh, more at risk than, than, than everybody else. Um, so, of course, across the globe, we're pursuing a uh, transition to clean energy. Uh, but I would also argue that that transition needs to be just. Uh, many of the industries most necessary for that transition to clean energy are also reliant on exploitation of forced labor. Um, for example, 40% 40, 40 of the world's polysilicon is linked to the Uyghur area of China, where we know there's state-sponsored forced labor. In the US, uh, they um, passed legislation a couple of years ago the Uyghur Forced Labour Prevention Act, and it's making a difference. So basically, you can't import goods uh, from that area of China into the US unless you can prove there's no forced labour. So they kind of um, turn the burden of proof on its head. Um, and I think that is making a difference. You know, goods are not going into the US. Of course, the risk is the UK then becomes a dumping ground because those supply chains get bifurcated. You can't get the goods into the US. Um, you, you don't want to spend the energy trying to prove they're not made with forced labor, well then you just turn them around and they can come into the UK. So a real issue uh, uh, about solar. Um, and as we think about the transition, of course, a lot of the emphasis is, is on solar. Similarly, the mining of critical minerals, which are absolutely necessary for electric vehicles, cobalt, copper, nickel, lithium, zinc, are all linked to human rights abuses. I mean, the very obvious one uh, is the issue about cobalt mining in both the Democratic Republic of Congo and the Congo Republic. Very, very strong evidence of both forced labor and, and child labor uh, in terms of those uh, mines, those artisanal mines in both those countries. So I'm not gonna talk about climate today, but I just would argue that human rights need to be embedded into all our efforts to build a green economy because we don't want to save the planet, but actually damage people massively uh, in the process. So hopefully having kind of put what I'm going to say in a bit of context, um, I thought I talked a little bit about modern slavery in the UK 
Now, when we use the term modern slavery, um, we use it as an umbrella term. So it will include human trafficking, it will include slavery, it will include the sort of domestic servitude I explained that was happening down the road from, from me, it would include forced labor, it would include organ harvesting. And it's interesting, um, the term modern slavery is a term we use in the UK, uh, they use it in Australia, but in many other parts of the world, um, Europe, the US, um, parts of Asia, India, they will still tend to use the term trafficking. And it's, it's a quite controversial about whether you should use the term sl slavery or trafficking. I think on balance, it's right that we use the term slavery, not least because it, ca it covers such a broad range of, of activity, but also because there's something shocking about the word. But I think there's something shocking about what's happening. So I think if it grabs people's attention, that's a good thing. So in terms of the UK, last year, 17,000 potential victims of modern slavery were referred to the Home Office. Now, I think 17,000 is, is, is a lot anyway. Um, but in fact, the global slavery estimates do break down um, that 50 million amongst countries. And their estimates for this year suggest that the real number is not 17,000, but 122,000. That amounts to 1.8 people for every 1,000 people in the UK. And in terms of prevalence, actually that's relatively low. If you look at all the figures in the global slavery um, estimates, out of 160 countries, we're 145th, so we're quite low down. But still, 122,000 people uh, is a lot of people. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, let me just, if I pull it down a little bit. Okay. Um, the top five nationalities, is that better? Um, that are referred into the Home Office as potential victims are Albanian, then British, Eritrean, Sudanese, and Vietnamese. And you've got a mix of countries there. Um, for many years, the highest number was actually British. Um, now, and this is probably because the figures for 2022 include a lot of Albanians who crossed on, on small boats, but they then became the largest individual. But Albania, British, Eritrean, Sudanese, and Vietnamese. And the majority of these referrals were for forced labor, which is in, reported in many sectors, uh, farming, hospitality, beauty, construction, manufacturing, car washes, domestic service, and other service industries. And as I mentioned, um, domestic workers, people who work in the home, um, who are often migrant workers, are particularly vulnerable to modern slavery. A recent investigation found that domestic workers, predominantly women from the Philippines and Indonesia, are held in domestic servitude in the households of London-based diplomats. According to the investigation, uh, at least 13 migrant domestic workers were employed by diplomats and referred as potential victims of modern slavery between 2017 and 2021. And they'd experienced having their passports retained, their wages withheld, being deprived of food, and confined to the household, among other abuses. I recently um, participated in a Channel 4 news investigation, uh, which was following a charity called the Voice of Domestic Workers, as they helped women to escape from servitude. Uh, and in one case, actually, one of the women had also been seriously sexually assaulted. And what struck me about this investigation uh, was that these women were being rescued from the smartest addresses in London. Um, they were living in fear and they were desperate to, to escape. Um, all three of them uh, escaped uh, with the help of this charity uh, and they would be uh, referred to the Home Office as potential victims but uh, I'm afraid their future will be challenging uh, from what I know. Uh, they'll wait uh, for a Home Office decision about whether they have been trafficked, um, uh, and that will take a year or two. But even if it's decided that they probably have been trafficked, that they're victims of, of slavery, um, there's no automatic right to stay here. Uh, and, and for women in those situations, claiming asylum uh, is not a good option. 
because these are women who are driven by poverty to leave their own children to look after the children of others thousands of miles away. That's the reality. So even though you know, it, it, was, it was really good that they were safe, they were out of the situation of exploitation, actually, I wasn't sure what the future would hold for them. And I think that's a, a, a real, real concern. Carrying on in terms of um, the sorts of slavery, 14% um, of those 17,000 uh, cases I mentioned uh, would be cases of sexual exploitation. And most of those victims will be women, uh, but some will be men. Uh, and they will have been trafficked to the United Kingdom. The uh, charity, the Salvation Army, delivers the uh, UK government's uh, contract to manage support services for survivors of modern slavery in England and Wales. Um, and they do a, a really good job. Uh, and looking at their latest statistics, uh, it would show that in terms of sexual exploitation, that's their second uh, largest group of, of clients. Uh, and people particularly from Nigeria, Iran, and Albania uh, are the countries that uh, the victims are coming from and to whom they're providing support. But in fact, over the last three or four years, the most rapid growth in cases of uh, slavery and trafficking has been for criminal exploitation. You might well have heard of uh, what's known as county lines drug dealing, where children and sometimes vulnerable adults are forced to carry drugs um, and basically do, do the running and the collection of the money uh, for the drug dealers. Uh, and there has been huge increases uh, in those numbers. But also, uh, children and vulnerable adults also forced to shoplift, uh, forced to beg, and forced to commit theft. All of those are increasing. And as I say, often children, uh, but not always, sometimes adults who are vulnerable for, for different reasons. And one of the problems with people in that situation is the law, the law in the United Kingdom is such that actually if you're forced to commit a criminal offence, then you shouldn't be doubly punished. There is a defence, a statutory defence to committing uh, crimes in that situation. So the law should be protecting people, but very often it doesn't, and people are prosecuted uh, anyway. And lastly, I'll mention organ trafficking, um, because in 2022, there was the first conviction for organ trafficking in the UK. Uh, Ike Ekwera Maudi, who is a, is, or was actually, a Nigerian politician and his wife, were convicted under the Modern Slavery Act for organ trafficking. The couple had brought a man from Lagos to the UK to become an organ donor for their daughter in exchange for 7,000 pounds and the promise of establishing a life in the UK. Now, if you remember the reporting of it at the time, the doctor uh, at the hospital in London was suspicious because this uh, young man had been told to say that he was a cousin of the woman concerned and, and the doctor thought that this wasn't right and, and reported it and this is what they were doing. Um, in exchange for £7,000, he was going to give uh, his kidney to this family. So I hope I've painted a picture of a, a range quite a depressing picture, I'm afraid, of different forms of exploitation, which are largely about people exploiting those they see as vulnerable to make money. And one of the things that we often say is, you know, that modern slavery really is a, is a form of economic crime. It's about profiting from the exploitation of others. So, so what, what is the government response? Um, over the last week or so, I've started to read uh, Theresa May's uh, memoir that was published a couple of weeks ago. And she talks about it in the beginning where she says, you know, I hope that I'll be remembered for my legislation on net zero, and for my legislation on the Modern Slavery Act. Of course, she realistically says what she'll be remembered for is being unable to pass Brexit legislation through Parliament. But, you know, that was a testament to, to the importance for her, at least, of that Modern Slavery Act. And, and to be fair, the Modern Slavery Act 2015 uh, was groundbreaking. I mean, the government frequently still call it groundbreaking. Um, it was groundbreaking in 2015. The legislation that we passed about transparency and supply chains um, was 
groundbreaking. So basically the requirement of the Modern Slavery Act says if you're a big business, so that means a turnover of more than 36 million pounds a year, then every year you are to write a modern slavery statement which sets out uh, what you've been doing in terms of addressing modern slavery. So what are your policies? What is your due diligence? You know, how much are you looking for it? Uh, what are you doing when you find it? Um, and what are you doing to improve? And that's a requirement on all big businesses. Those statements have to be signed off by the board of the company. They have to be signed by a director. Uh, and they have to be published annually. That was pretty groundbreaking, um, what is it, eight years ago. There was also uh, the establishment of the post that I used to hold, the Independent Anti-Slavery Commissioner post. Most countries uh, haven't got a similar. Um, quite a few European countries have rapporteurs, but I think ours was regarded as a, a good model, and it's a model I think the Australians uh, are about to follow because their government has announced that they are eventually going to have a commissioner. Because what, what government is doing is appointing somebody and putting them on their payroll who is in all likelihood going to criticize what they're doing. And that takes a degree of um, uh, principle, I think, to do that. Um, and also, I mentioned the Salvation Army contract, um, the uh, contract that we have in the UK to support victims of modern slavery, um, and there's complicated rules about who's eligible. But suffice it to say, I have been to many safe houses across the country where people are provided with, with support, um, both um, you know, physically somewhere to live, um, but also um, access to counselling, access to legal support, uh, and access to um, health uh, services. It's not perfect, but it's a lot better than most other countries. And in fact, the uh, Global Slavery Index that I mentioned um, rates all countries um, for the government response. And in fact, the UK government response is just the best score across the globe. However, uh, the report also says that the recent prioritization of immigration control was undermining this, and I'll come to that in a minute. But I would argue not only has the recent uh, focus on immigration control undermined support for victims, but also the government has fallen short on its uh, commitments it's made three years ago now to update um, all the legislation on transparency and supply chains. Uh, the government had uh, accepted that they needed to be much clearer about what was required from businesses in terms of what was in the statements, that they were going to publish new guidance, that they were going to make it mandatory for companies to upload their uh, statements onto a government registry, um, that they were going to have a single reporting deadline, and they were going to, importantly, uh, extend the requirement to the public sector as well as companies, because the odd thing about the legislation is the government uh, required companies to do this, but didn't require local authorities, government departments, police forces, health services to do it, which I always thought was deeply, deeply ironic. Um, but also, they had eventually committed to saying, if companies don't comply, then there should be a sanction in the form of some sort of fine, which is some, one of the problems is when governments pass legislation and there's very little sanction. Um, 75, 80, 90% of companies will do the right thing, but they get really frustrated for the ones who get away with just ignoring the legislation. Um, and, and if you don't have sanctions, or if you have minimal sanctions and you don't use them, then people think they can get away with it, uh, and they do. But not only, I would argue, that uh, we've not kept our promises, but we're also falling behind what's been happening uh, in the European Un Union, where quite a few countries, uh, countries such as France, Germany, Norway, have all passed legislation mandating human rights due diligence. Um, that's way beyond where the UK has gone, which basically says companies haven't just got to do, do due diligence for human rights as a matter of um, good practice, but actually that the law would require them. And then if there were problems in their supply chains, then clearly they could be held to account. Um, and not only have individual European countries passed this legislation, but the European Union um, has agreed that there is going to be a corporate sustainability uh, due diligence directive, which is all about both environmental issues and human rights issues. Um, 
and that will, both those approaches, uh, surpass anything that's in our own Modern Slavery Act. So I would say that the, the government um, passed good legislation. It already needs updating, which they've accepted but not done, but actually we're, we're falling behind the rest of the world. But I think in terms of government response in the UK, the most concerning developments have been the Nationalities and Borders Act, which was passed last year, and the Illegal Migration Act, which was passed this year, both of which begin to roll back the protection for victims of modern slavery. Because they focus on a person's immigration status rather than protecting them as vulnerable individuals. Let me explain um, what I mean by that. The Nationality and Borders Act basically defined ways in which the government um, could um, avoid its uh, responsibility to provide support for victims of modern slavery. They did that uh, by including in the legislation what they called a, a public order exemption. Uh, and they were said if there's a public order exemption, they couldn't provide support for a victim of slavery. Now, the idea of a public order exemption is, to be fair, in the European Convention Against Trafficking. However, it was only ever intended to be used by a state if there was such public disorder that they couldn't really support people. That was how it was intended, if there was a general threat to public order. What our legislation does it defines it so much more broadly to basically say it's a public order threat if we support migrants who have criminal records. In, in effect, I'm, I'm, I'm shortening it, but that's in effect what it is, criminal records, and, and basically sentenced to more than 12 months. So it, it captures an awful lot of criminal records. Um, it also uh, enacted powers to deny support where there's a, an element of bad faith or for those who've already been supported. Um, these... Uh, changes begin to undermine support for victims of, of trafficking and these new powers were enacted uh, at the beginning of January this year and therefore what you see in the data that's uh, published the April to June data the first quarter uh, that's been published there were 159 disqualifications in support so 159 people that the Home Office said were victims of slavery or trafficking but they said for a public order reason, i.e. they've got a criminal record, we're not going to support them. Lawyers, of course, challenged the decision on behalf of some claimants who've been denied this support, uh, and they obtained an interim order last July, and there'll be a full hearing, uh, I think, in February next year. And basically the argument is that in denying victims of trafficking this support, the Home Secretary is breaching her Article 4 positive duty to protect victims, victims of trafficking. And of course, it's Article 4 of the European Convention of Human Rights. Um, we understand that the Home Secretary has not made any decisions to deny support uh, since that order, and we'll see what happens next year. Um, and in fact, I, I, I checked that out the other day, uh, and I think that is definitely the case. So that's the first kind of um, attack on protections. The much more significant one is contained in the Legal Migration Act, which I'm sure most of you are aware of because of the kind of broader issue about refugees and asylum seekers. Um, but basically, it says that those who've been identified as potential victims of modern slavery and who've entered the country irregularly will, like all other people who've entered the country irregularly, be subject to the requirement on the Home Secretary to detain and remove and are banned from claiming asylum. So the law that applies to asylum seekers is applying to victims of modern slavery as well. And so we've passed law in the UK which is about detaining and removing those who are victims of a serious crime. And even um, if you followed any of the debates in, in the House of Commons and some fantastic debates in the House of Lords, um, but in the House of Commons, Theresa May um, talked about this and she, she said, you know, in the government's desire to be tough on immigration, they have just viewed victims of modern slavery as collateral damage. Now, there is uh, what they call a sunset provision on that uh, 
those clauses, which means that they can only be in place for two years. And I think that's a recognition of the fact that actually what's happening here is pretty serious. But and, as you might imagine, uh, huge outcry for many, many international organizations of what ha has what's happened. Now, at the moment, the powers, of course, have yet to be enacted right across the board because the government doesn't have the capacity to detain people and nor does it have the ability to remove them to a third country such as Rwanda. And you'll probably have read in the papers today that the Supreme Court will consider the general issue of uh, removing people to Rwanda this week. Um, and uh, I'll be careful what I say because this is being live streamed, but those of you who watch what happens in the Supreme Court, all I'll say it's not what it was under Lady Hale in terms of its decisions and it's the likelihood of the decisions going uh, with the government. And I know government are reasonably confident. Let, let us see, let us see what happened. Because of that, of course, the decision in the Supreme Court on Rwanda is really important for victims of modern slavery. And while I won't, because, because what will happen is that they, like anybody else, who's come to this country irregularly, even if they've been coerced, forced, intimidated, tricked, they too will end up in Rwanda. And if you look at any of the reports about the way in which the Rwandan government support or don't support victims of modern slavery, it is not, in my view, the right place uh, for them. And while I won't rehearse the arguments about remaining in the European Convention of Human Rights, uh, you can see that for victims of modern slavery, the stakes are very high. Uh, over the last five years, um, lawyers have fought for victims' rights with the Home Office regularly, citing both the European Convention Against Trafficking and the European Convention of Human Rights. And basically, the European Convention Against Trafficking rests on Article 4 of the European Convention of Human Rights, so the, the two are very linked. So it matters so much, and uh, uh, every time there's been a, an undermining uh, in, in practice uh, of victims' rights. Actually, there has been um, a challenge and the courts have on the whole gone with the challenge and um, uphold the Article 4 rights that victims have. So it's, it's, a really, it's a really difficult time for those who support victims because there is a sense in which there's a general undermining. And, and I would argue so much of it stems from that fundamental point about viewing what I see is victims and survivors of serious crime, but viewing them not in that light, but purely through the lens of immigration and their immigration status. So let's move on to the uh, business response. When I was invited to give this lecture, uh, it was suggested that you'd be particularly interested in the role of business, and in particular financial services. Uh, as Jessica mentioned, uh, I work uh, for CCLA Investment Management, as a consultant on modern slavery. Uh, CCLA, uh, we're in asset managers, uh, and we aim to meet our clients, many of whom are churches and charities, that's the C and the C in the title. Uh, we, we, we always try and uh, meet our clients' objectives in a way that aligns with their values. But we also uh, believe in the power of investing to affect change, to build a better world. So we use our ownership rights to improve uh, the sustainability of assets in which we invest. So, um, and we're particularly keen on doing that, actively engaging with companies uh, to deal with systemic risks. And one of the systemic risks that we're keen on dealing with are risks of modern slavery. So uh, it's really very important as investors. Uh, and one of the things that we do at CCLA, we brought together 64 other investors, so 65 different investors from the kind of the, the largest um, asset managers and asset owners down to the smallest, um, 15 trillion assets under management, and we work as a collaboration uh, to try and improve the response to modern slavery in the businesses in which we uh, own or which we manage uh, the assets. We do that from a basis that modern slavery risks are all pervasive, uh, as I explained at the beginning, and that companies should be really looking to find them, should be working on the assumption that they are pervasive, and what are they doing to find them and then fix them, and in particular, uh, ensuring that workers that are exploited and abused are provided with remedy. 
that they're compensated, and that, frankly, is often the weakest part of it. So that's what we do uh, as, uh, as investors. Let me kind of unpack that a little bit. And I, just a few words of explanation. In the investment world, we often talk about sustainable investment, and we're talking about both the environmental issues and the human rights issues. But if I go back to my earlier comment, I think sometimes it's, it's a mistake to think of the two as being two silos, because actually the, the issue between damaging the globe and damaging people uh, are very, very closely related. Uh, and we also sometimes use the term ESG, which stands for Environmental, Social and Governance, and that's thinking about actually what are the environmental issues, the social issues, the human rights issues, and the governance issues, and thinking about businesses uh, in, the, in those terms. So I would argue in terms of business that slavery is a failure of the market, and in fact, Obama made the same comment. It's both a salient risk to companies, i.e. it matters, but it's a material risk, i.e. it will damage their financial performance in the long term. And I was trying to think of an example to give you, and I was thinking about, um, do you remember during COVID, there were those concerns about the factories that were producing goods for Boohoo in Leicester? There was a lot of issues about it, a lot of COVID in those factories. Um, while modern slavery wasn't found, there was certainly a lot of exploitation. And you know, since 2020, since that happened, Boohoo shares have dropped by 90%. Now, there will be other factors involved, but I do think uh, it makes uh, the point that actually uh, being connected with exploitation is a material risk to businesses. But I kind of go back to my theme that slavery is not new. Um, businesses also have a long history of human rights abuses. Uh, for example, you know, the British East India Company was involved in the slave trade 200 years ago. So this, again, you know, is not new about businesses. Um, and as I said earlier, 28 million people uh, held in forced labor across the globe, most of them in private business. People have been tricked, coerced, or forced into exploitation and cannot escape. However, many of those vulnerable workers across the globe, on farms, mines, fisheries, and factories, are hidden from all of us as UK consumers. Often, but not always, migrant workers are the ones who suffer. But they're at the end of very long, opaque supply chains. A full map of the risks in a company's value chain from the raw material to the consumer is really difficult to establish when suppliers are separate companies operating on the other side of the world. The structures and business practices of modern companies at best tolerate exploitation. At worst, they create an environment in which it can flourish. So what can investors do? Well, the financial performance of companies is well understood, but assessing them on both environmental issues or on human rights records is much uh, more complicated. Uh, the first thing to understand is that there's no such thing as a perfect company when it comes to these issues. Uh, it's got to be about progress, not, not perfection. And, and the second thing, and investors love data, um, and uh, data is a challenge. You know, even measuring carbon, which is often argued is the kind of straightforward measure, it is, it is so much more complex. And those of you who are interested in issues about the environment, you know, when we talk about businesses, we talk about their impact. Uh, in terms of scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions. So the, the emissions that you actually, um, the scope one emissions which are directly from your company's operations. So how, you know, how much smoke are you belching into the uh, uh, atmosphere? Scope two comes from the electricity and heat that you purchase for your operations. And scope three, it's all about the emissions that you're indirectly responsible for. Uh, for products from its suppliers and for products when the customers use them. So that in itself is complicated. Bad enough for environmental and climate issues, but actually um, really in terms of human rights, there is no agreed way to measure the harm companies do to human rights, including modern slavery. And even if there was, even if we could develop the perfect metric, I'm clear that it would always be vital to listen to the lived experience of those involved, that the metrics will never tell you the whole story. Until recently, governments have generally asked companies to voluntarily comply with efforts to advance human rights. Um, you might have heard of the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, and they set out the standards very clearly, but compliance is voluntary. And the theory of governments for a long time was that all of us as consumers, 
NGOs, um, investors would drive up the standards. And while there's some evidence of that, it's not enough. And therefore, you've got the move across the globe to replace soft regulation with hard regulation. And the EU law that's, that I mentioned are the most significant attempt to legally mandate companies to carry out due diligence. But one of the interesting questions for those of us who work in financial services is to what extent do we have responsibility for what the companies to whom we lend uh, or in whom we invest have? Um, and this has been a lively debate for a very long time about if you're a bank, for example, should you be considered as causing or contributing to adverse human rights if they arise from your clients' activities? Um, and uh, I think there's a general acknowledgement that in some cases you might be. Whether you're therefore responsible for any remedy or any compensation is, is much more disputed. And that's a key argument at the moment in the uh, European Union's uh, draft due diligence because you've got the Commission uh, circulating their draft and then Parliament saying something different. Basically, the argument is that the Commission is carving out financial services, saying actually it's too hard for financial services, where the European Parliament to say, no, we're never going to solve these issues unless we say to financial services, to banks, to investors, that you do have some responsibility for whom you're lending to. You do have responsibility for the companies in which you invest. And uh, it's, it's a very lively debate. At, at CCLA, uh, where I work, we're quite clear uh, that we think uh, financial services should be caught by legislation. We think they should be caught by our own Modern Slavery Act uh, with an explicit requirement uh, for financial services to report on their portfolios. Um, we did some work a few years ago uh, and we thought we'd uh, convince one of the ministers of the sense of this and there was a very good debate in Westminster Hall about it. Uh, it, it felt tantalizingly close, but as you know, two years is a long time uh, in, in politics. And while I think, you know, t talking to, to, to my boss at CCLA, it would be very challenging. Um, but, you know, I don't think modern slavery and human trafficking will ever be abolished without the active participation of the financial services industry. So it's, as I say, very, very live debate. And we would argue that certainly the UK legislation needs to quite explicitly include uh, financial services. And before I move off the business thing, I just thought I'd comment, if you, if you follow these sorts of things, of course, there is a kind of, I would say, a, a, a direction in, in terms of improvement and progress. I've kind of explained about how legislation is changing. In general, uh, businesses are responding, not all of them. Um, but of course, there is a backlash. Um, investors, as I've mentioned, talk about ESG. The term ESG in the United States has become utterly embroiled in culture wars. You have Elon Musk, I shouldn't really quote Elon Musk in a cathedral, but I will, because he's called ESG communism rebranded. And you know, there are 15 states in the US who've made it illegal for their pension funds to make ESG considerations when thinking about investments. So that there is a real sense of the backlash. And if, and if we want to say that's just in the US, I think we should really watch what's happening uh, in politics in this country. Did you notice after Nigel Farage and the Coutts debacle, he railed against what he called woke capitalism? And we also know he thinks there should be a referendum on, on net zero. So I, I do think that for those of us who care about the environment and human rights, the bipartisan agreement, which has often existed both in the UK and the US, and to a large extent in Europe, I think is beginning to, if, if not break down, under severe tension as you get the polarization of politics, and I think we should all be concerned about that. And lastly, what can I do? In the words of Alistair Campbell's most recent book, but what can I do? I mean, I work as a, a, for a university and for an investment management company who wants to make a difference. So I, in my professional life, uh, I'm trying to uh, further this cause, to really think about what it means to abolish uh, slavery by 2030. Um, but what can I do as an individual? And I've got three suggestions I'm gonna make in finishing. The one is, um, if you go online, there is uh, 
a website called slaveryfootprint.org. And basically, it's a little survey you can take online, and it will tell you how many slaves you own. And basically, it's about your consumption, because it's based on this uh, view that it's endemic, and it's, as I say, entwined in our daily life. So if you're interested, have a look. How many slaves do you own? Slaveryfootprint.org. I think the second thing I think is really important is to speak up when you hear discriminatory attitudes towards migrants, asylum seekers, and refugees. I would say these attitudes are the strongest drivers of vulnerability, a vulnerability which manifests itself in a hostile environment for those who are arriving and living in the UK. And I do think we need to speak up when we hear those attitudes. I was talking to a, a, a former colleague this week who'd been doing some work on people displaced from Eritrea, where, as you know, there's been a civil war for a very long time. And he was saying that when they go over the border into the Sudan, where there are lots of refugee camps, and you know, the Sudan really can't afford to support people, but they do. He said, when they go across the first border, they are refugees, and they have rights under the Refugee Convention. He said, what appears to happen then, somehow, if some of them then leave and travel north and come to Europe, we stop calling them refugees, and we call them migrants. Migrants who we regard as having no rights. And I thought that was a very interesting comment. And so we just, just, I think, just to challenge those sorts of attitudes which are all pervasive. And the last point is when, in the UK, goods, or probably services, like a car wash, like a nail bar, when they're so cheap that it's too good to be true. Maybe it is. Just consider the fact that you're closer to the exploitation of another human being than you would ever want to be. Thank you. for different reasons, uh, move away from where they, um, where they originally lived, um, uh, maybe forced out by things that, um, that, that, that are driven by global instability, which is also, uh, you know, climate change is one of those drivers. Um, it, it, it gives rise, amongst other things, to conflict and civil war and fight, fight over ever scarcer resources. So this is something that's going to get worse rather than better, and the number of people on the move is going to go up. Um, and at the same time, you are setting out some kind of worrying political uh, undercurrents that uh, seem to be uh, behaving more in fear than in humanity. So are things going to get worse before they get better? I think you're asking me a kind of quite a broad political question, but that point I made about bipartisan approaches to issues such as human rights and climate, I do think they're under stress. Uh, I am a, I, in everything I've seen, it seems to me to be international collaboration. Looking out, not looking in, is the way we're gonna have to deal with these problems, and it worries me that so many countries across the globe are looking in and not out, including our own country, and goodness knows what's gonna happen in the US next year with an election, so I, I do think it's really important. One of the things that has struck me um, about the issue about uh, small boat survivals, and even last year, when there were lots of Albanian people coming, most people 
that were coming on those small boats were coming from Iran, Afghanistan, Sudan, Eritrea, countries where it, it, their chances of being given asylum are very great and where there are real issues we'd understand. Of course we don't want people smugglers taking you across a dangerous route, but actually there is a real issue there. My view about the solution to that, rather than the, what, some rather interesting ideas about how to try and stop the boats, Surely it's got to be about international collaboration and it's got to be about working with our neighbours, not just in Europe, but, but beyond. If you put your hand up, I'll bring round the mic. Hi, thank you for that. Um, I'm a, a lecturer in Middle East Studies at Cambridge University and uh, one of the things I've got here is three suggestions. It's a key message you'd like to give to our political group. Can I just say thank you? You're a very active listener. You're very encouraging as uh, you were giving the lecture. Um, so I would say the most important thing for police officers is to think, um, is, is to be kind of professionally curious and not take things at face value. You know, the, the title of this lecture was Hidden in Plain Sight. And I think police officers, police forces have got better at identifying victims of slavery and trafficking. But when you have arrested a young lad or young girl in possession of drugs 100 miles away from home, it's, you know, it's quite likely that they've been trafficked. So, you know, is that part of your investigation? Or are you professionally curious about that? Um, similarly, I talked about forced criminality, shoplifting. You know, there's lots of media coverage, isn't there, about shoplifting increasing. Some of that will be trafficked children and vulnerable people who are forced into it. So thinking about that, thinking about um, what's behind um, what you think it's dealing with, just asking the third question. The other, the other case, uh, a similar, so, similar sort of argument, also when you're dealing with children who've been really very badly damaged, they will behave in a way which is difficult as a police officer to deal with, but actually just think about why that might be. So it's that professional curiosity I would encourage every time. So, um, thank you very much. So professionally, I hold that responsibility within my job title. And safeguarding, people forget that modern slavery is very much a safeguarding issue. And by extension, it overlaps into things like serious violence duty. And there are many other considerations when um, you are, I hate to word, say the words, it's not just frontline workers, it's that strategic working as well. And those messages that need to go out down to all the points in a business, not just a corporate strategy line or it's on it. I can see you nodding, you know what I'm saying. As you know, in safeguarding, we say that safeguarding is everybody's business, and it's not just about the things that we might have seen on the media or read. It is these very, very discreet presentations that happen. And in my humble experience, traffickers are very discreet about their livestock, because that is what they are. They're not humans. I think that was a statement rather than a question, and I would probably agree with virtually everything you said, so well, well, well said. I mean, I, I would say traffickers are similar to a lot of other criminals, that they are very agile, they're quick to adapt, and they stay ahead of law enforcement more often than we're probably comfortable with. Um, but your point about um, the importance of getting messages through organizations, equipping people, make sure that they've had the right training, all that kind of thing. because. I, I deal with it, I guess, more in business now. You know, what often happens in a business when a case of slavery or trafficking is identified, people say, oh, I thought something wasn't quite right, but I didn't feel able to say anything. So that point about just equipping people so that there's no problem if you just pass on a concern and there's a way to do it and a way that can be handled properly and everybody's safeguarded, all those sorts of things really matter. 
And I know they're not rocket science, but they're the sorts of things that we just have to continually push so that we do um, identify cases early and protect people. Yeah, I, I hope that, uh, I mean, you may have answered some of this, in, but it's really quite hard to hear right at the back here. But the um, question I've got is around how does civil society kind of reconvene itself and try and hold government and it's, you know, entirely malign manipulations to account um, when we have an opposition who is timid and uh, who seems to lack the moral will to do so. And we seem to only be able to rely upon the likes of the Good Law Project and people of that sort to start to shine the light, perhaps open democracy as well. There's a, there are, you know, there are some dreadful things that are going on presently. And we watch kind of in horror. And what do we do? Two or three thoughts. I mean, I mentioned the fact that there has been quite a lot of litigation um, and effective litigation to guard and protect victims' rights. Um, but I think there's a more general point, isn't there, which is about political engagement. And if you speak to members of parliament, or indeed if you speak to businesses, you know, they will respond. If we are all emailing our members of parliament or we're raising it with businesses about human rights abuses, about modern slavery, then they will take note. You know, th that's what they always say. So if we're, if we're not raising the issue, if we're not speaking up, uh, then it's, it's not a surprise that businesses feel more under pressure to do something about climate than they do about human rights, or members of parliament think that actually what the opinion surveys say that most people care about immigration therefore we can run roughshod over people's human rights so I, I do think there's something about all of us speaking up um, there is a role for NGOs and you know many of you you're here at an amnesty event you support NGOs but I think actually as citizens uh, we need to be speaking up because that's the way uh, to influence uh, our members of parliament I think Well, this gentleman first, and then you. I'm, I'm so sorry about this thing. In order to, I, I feel like I have to like eat the microphone to, <laughs> for it to be loud. Hello. Hello. My name is David. I'm frustrated, and I think I may be naive. Just linking into the question of the previous gentleman, uh, saying, "What do we, as society?" We see so many horrible things and you read about so many terrible things. What part in eliminating modern slavery in this country do religious leaders have, if any at all? I think there are lots of examples of faith leaders in this country um, taking uh, a part. So one of the initiatives you've um, pursued at Ely here is with the Clua Foundation, which is a Church of England organization. They have, for example, a um, safer car wash app, if you're concerned about car washes, to report. They've done educational programs for children, and I think they've also now got a, an agricultural workers app. So that's a Church of England example. Um, the Roman Catholic Church has been very active, um, both in providing safe houses, in campaigning. I mean, the Pope has said some brilliant things about migrants in particular, but actually modern slavery uh, as well. And, and if I think about so many of the safe houses that I've been to in the UK have some sort of uh, link with religious sisters or church groups. So I would say the church, they can always do more 
but I would say there is definitely uh, evidence of both the main churches I'm aware of um, being quite involved. And in fact, actually, I got an invitation only this week to, from two bishops to talk about the impact of the Illegal Migration Act. They want to have a round table of, of people with a view to them raising concerns. And if you look at the, the, the you know, it's a controversial issue about whether we should have bishops in the House of Lords, we've got them. And actually some of the best speeches against the Illegal Migration Act were from the bishops. The Archbishop of Canterbury was excellent on the issue of refugees and migrants. So I, I, so I, do, I do see the church being active, but of course it could do more. This may seem a very naive question. I consider myself quite a, a careful consumer. I would doubt to embark on having further poems and various other items um, on an extension. How do I know that I'm sourcing it ethically? So I think it's very difficult for consumers in general, um, and that's why I think government's got a role. But if you have uh, an appetite to do a bit of research, there is a very good um, academic called, I think it's Laura T. Murphy at Sheffield Hallam. She's written at least two reports on solar and she names the companies. And because the US um, continually publish the, ch the countries that are linked to the uh, Xinjiang region that they're concerned about. So, Every so often I get an update saying they've added three more companies. But Laura's work um, does list quite a lot of the companies. So that's, that's one way of doing it. I mean, I know, it's, I know it's really frustrating as a sort of individual consumer you've got to do this, but that would be a place to have a look and, and ask your builder where they're coming from. To be honest, it's really difficult. with so, Because it, I, I quoted 40% of the solar panels. At one point it was 45%. It is an awful lot because it's, it's the where the polycylon comes from which is required for solar panels. But look at Laura's work and see if it, na it does name some of the manufacturers and maybe that will be somewhere to, to go. But it's a really good question. I mean, I personally think the answer is that we should have legislation like the United States which says, um, I, I, I'm not sure you should necessarily just um, focus on, on the Xinjiang area of China, but that if goods are made with forced labour, then they should not be allowed into this country. And, and, and by the way, the EU are going to have that sort of legislation. The Americans have already got it. The risk of us being a dumping ground is really quite significant. Thank you so much for this very interesting lecture. My question is, you mentioned there are already some mechanisms by the government or by the international organizations like the UN, for instance, these women's empowerment principles. And sometimes big reliable companies, they become signatories of, of these principles or charters. They put this logo on their websites and then probably forget about it. So how to encourage these big companies that can actually become real drivers in the business world to close this value action gap? Thank you. One of the things that I've been doing over the summer with colleagues at CCLA is looking at the modern slavery statements for the FTSE 100 um, and assessing them. And it's very clear that there's a big gap between the ones that take the risk seriously and the ones that don't. And we've been basically tiering them in a, in a benchmark, so putting them into kind of five groups. Um, so there are examples where companies are taking it seriously. But it goes back to the point that um, I made in terms of political involvement. People I know who work in sort of the human rights area of businesses, because they will have dedicated professional people now doing it, they will say, you know, the CEO will say, but customers are not raising this issue as you want to raise it about your solar panels, but they are raising issues about plastics or climate or something else. So there is something about actually just raising it with, with the companies um, as well. So two things, there is a difference between the top and the bottom. Secondly, I think that the consumer voice can be heard. But this is why I talked about, even though it's quite complicated, all that mandating of due diligence, because I do think um, for those companies who um, don't take their responsibilities seriously, there is a, a role 
for regulation and hard law and forcing them to do it. I think we should be coming towards the end. We should have just one more question. Thanks for your talk. This was interesting. Uh, but in general, uh, you've left me, and I suspect some others, uh, rather pessimistic and rather sad about the situation. I would like to remind people that the history of Britain particularly on slavery, has led the world largely from Wilberforce onwards. We did an awful lot. And I would also like to say that this area is very much um, agricultural and therefore your comments on um, slavery on farms is very relevant around here. But of course, the thing to remember is the vast majority of farmers are absolutely honest and they're all following the law. Um, and not employing slaves. It, there's a handful, perhaps, but in general, um, people like us in this room are doing their best to avoid these things. And industry overall, you know, CCLA, and many of us in this room will be on PCCs with money invested in CCLA. We're well aware of what they're doing. But in, in, at the end of the day, CCLA is an investment company, just like the rest, you're doing more with with your help and so on to control things, but in general, it's very, very difficult. I, I've got panels on my house, and they were made in China. What am I supposed to do? Not put them up because they're coming from China. It's extremely difficult to make these decisions when you're an ordinary individual. And I, I think people should just do their very best, support the police, support the churches, support the charities, but just do your best. You can't begin to control this matter very well. You need to be honest yourself and deal with it privately. So I, I think that's why I suggested in the first of my sections on response was the government's response because I do think it's hard for consumers and I agree with you that the UK um, has a good history and even with modern slavery and that was the point I was making we were leading the world. My concern is that actually in the last 10 years, we've fallen back from that. And I just wanted to, um, you know, I'm, I, it can be quite depressing. And I thought that as I was going through various forms of slavery, which is why I was trying to leave you on a high note about, yes, there are things that we, could, we can all do. Um, but I think the point about farmers, I, I, I understand completely the point you're making. But it's, as somebody said at the back there, that traffickers, can be very cunning and wily because they're criminals. And, and I've worked with one of the, you know, the best farms in this area uh, and who've done so much work to protect workers and you know, still, still engage with them. But they ended up employing people who've been trafficked because organized criminals were behind it. So it's, it's not that people want to do the wrong thing, it's actually that we're talking about a crime here and that criminals who want to make money out of the exploitation of other people can be very clever. And we just need to be, as you say, support the police where we need to, and, uh, and hopefully people are brought to justice. Um, but they are criminals, and, and they, they do, I'm afraid, uh, trick and deceive a lot of us who are, who are law-abiding. So I hope, I'm sorry if I've made you all very depressed. I'd hoped there would be a bit of a call to action, but clearly... <laughs> Uh, but this is a serious business, and I think that sense in which sometimes we're closer than we realise, I think, is an important, uh, important point. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your um, engagement and attention um, and involvement in this really important issue. Um, if I could just ask you just to say once again what the online... Um, uh, um, Slavery Footprint, slaveryfootprint.org. Slaveryfootprint.org. I had a, a, a query just from near the back. I haven't quite heard what it was. Thank you very much My indeed. Pleasure.